Mercer, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Nights at the Roundtable, brought to you by pwcnews.us and our producer, Bill Golden. Today, my guest is Mark Gibson, independent candidate for the 11th District. Mark, thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me, Kenny. I'm really excited to hear that you're um, going to be soliciting um, signatures for the petition. Is how, help me out That's here. okay. It's, it's a, uh, it's it's a, a ballot, porky pig moment. It's a, it's a ballot petition, there and, we go. and it is the only way that independent candidates can get on the ballot for the general election in November. And how many signatures are required? Uh, I have to have 1,000 validated signatures. Uh, the State Board of Elections suggests that we collect uh, 1,500 case any are on the wrong form or if they're not actually voters or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're about halfway to the 1,000 now, so that's pretty good. Uh, we've got a couple big things coming up. We'll be uh, at the Dale City Farmer's Market in the next few Sundays uh, at Viva Vienna in uh, Vienna uh, on uh, the Sunday and Monday of Memorial Day weekend. And then the various farmers markets, wherever I can get to it. Um, the hardest part is finding large groups of people in a public place. Mm -hmm. I can't go outside a supermarket, they chase you off. Uh, libraries are pretty good, um, but farmers markets have been a, a good haul for signatures. Mm -hmm. And everything has to be into uh, Richmond by June 10th. Have you done this before? I have. We did it in 2012. Uh -huh. uh, there were six candidates on the ballot for the 11th district. Uh, I finished third, a distant third, mind you, no. but for a, for a non-major party candidate, uh, it felt pretty good. What inspires you to, to because it's a big step and it, it takes is. so much time. It does. Um, I, I think like a lot of other people, uh, I was frustrated with the political process. Uh, with the tenor of the conversation, with the lack of conversation, with the name calling and all that. Yeah. I, I just felt, you know, I consider myself a, a middle of the road kind of guy. Um, and I just felt we hadn't been served by the parties very well. Mm -hmm. The parties have been going left or right. And uh, I feel uh, we've just been left. I think there's a lot of voters that feel pretty much the same way. We, we, you know, there's no faster way to turn me off than to start talking bad about somebody else. That just ruins that for me. And I'm not interested in what somebody else has done. I'm interested in what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. I, I follow you um, on Twitter mm -hmm. and Google Plus and a couple other places, and I like some of your econ economic theories, things you talk about, the economy. Um, I'm always, it just seems like such practical advice. Do you have a background in economics? Yeah, I have a degree, a master's degree in economics. As I've told other people, I, I used to be an economist. I'm not an economist anymore. Uh, so that, that training kind of helps me pull some thoughts together, gel some general ideas about where we should be going as a country with the economy. Um, right now, I'm, I'm a manager of a small company, a small IT firm in Fairfax City. Uh, that suits me well. I'm good with numbers and people and projects mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we're uh, a federal government contractor uh, working within the, the Department of Defense. And so have you too felt the impact from uh, contraction? Uh, not really uh, so much. Uh, sequestration affected a lot of companies. We had been built into the budget for a long term. Mm -hmm. um, we'd had a little bit of uh, shifting just because of the contracts and the way they turn over every year. But um, sequestration itself didn't affect us. How do you... How do you see the future as far as government contracting? You know, Northern Virginia, we are so dependent upon the government for jobs. And everyone we know, people right here in the room with us, are feeling those effects. So do you see that as as reinvigorating or or it's just going to continue the slow downward spiral? or Well, there's two sides of it. I mean, the federal government does provide a lot of employment. They've provided us with great wealth in this area. Mm -hmm. um, in Fairfax County, our young employment's a little bit under 4%. In Prince William, I think it's closer to 6%. Mm -hmm. um, and a great deal of that is due to federal government employment. Um, the federal government's going to have to change a little. Uh, right now, we pay about two-thirds of the budget out to people in the form of checks. Right. We're not buying things. We're just sending out checks. Right. Um, so a lot of the services that we need the government to provide, public goods and services, perhaps aren't being provided. Um, I, I think we need more diversification here in the area. We've mm -hmm. been dependent on the federal government for a really long time. Um, not to say that we should disband the federal government and, and no, kind of go on our sure. own, but we do need a little more diversification. Uh, some of the life sciences have been a, a major key in uh, Fairfax County. Mm -hmm. um, here down in Prince William, I think there's a lower cost uh, of doing business. 
um, some of those things could, could come into Prince William as well as Fairfax County gets more expensive. You know, one of the, the problems as I see it in Prince William County is we focus so much on residential development mm -hmm. that we really have very few locations available for big business should they want to locate right. here, like a north of Grumman or someplace like that. We just, we really have very few parcels of land that are appropriate. And we have invested quite a bit in Innovation Park, and there is some movement there, particularly in life sciences, but it just, it's not enough. Uh, Jeff Kazmarek, the um, uh, economic director for Prince William County, gave his quarterly, quarterly report recently, and I I think he said they generated 60 new jobs. Well, if there's 430,000 people in Prince William County, 60 new jobs is just not not it. It's a drop in the bucket. Right. Um, in Fairfax County, they haven't really relied on an innovation park or, or a coordinated effort. It's actually been somewhat diverse and uh, dispersed throughout mm -hmm. the county. Uh, certainly, Tyson's Corner is, um, is a magnet for, sure. for big business, as are some other areas. Um, having... I think it's, again, a lot of the prosperity of questions, whether it's um, you know, how we grow the, the, the diversified economy that we have, uh, how our roads are put in, a lot of it depends on local zoning. Right. So I think each county needs to look at itself, uh, but at, as a region, as a Northern Virginia region, I think we all need to think and say, okay, the, the federal government is going to downsize it at some point. Mm -hmm. Let's be prepared for it, and let's start diversifying what we have. So if you were elected, what specific, what, what channels would you follow? What, what uh, would you focus on to make those things happen? Well, you know, I, I think the, the key is, is preparing everybody for it. Um, uh, Jerry Connolly, who's our, our current congressman, he's focused on federal employment, um, it, whether it be through the IRS or the post office or moving the FBI uh, to, uh, to Merrifield. Um, I think a great deal of his focus has been on increasing federal employment. Mm -hmm. um, I'd probably take a different tack, knowing that you know, we're not getting the services that we, we need, bridges, whatever it might exactly. be, uh, that we, in fact, need to shift our focus and say, okay, well, the federal government's not going to be there as much. Mm -hmm. um, so let's try to make the government as, as efficient as possible, cut out the overhead, cut out the things we don't need, and... Whomever is watching this might disagree with me, but let's look at Saturday postal service delivery. Um, I get yeah. nothing on Saturday. <laughs> um, I don't even want mail. Yeah. That, really, I mean that is a concept that's just it's limited to a specific number of people. There's whole segments of the population now. We don't we don't mail. We pay our bills online. We get our prescriptions online. You know, we just don't mail. All our bills are auto debit. We. We don't have a mortgage payment, but when we did, it was auto debit. We just don't need the mail like that right. anymore. And, and I'm not picking up postal workers. They, they, do, I know. they do a terrific job in an often harsh environment. I, I saw a dog chase a, a mail carrier the other day. Wow. It still happens. Um, but I think we just need to fix, change our shift. There was a, a terrific article in the Post uh, about a month ago about how we're storing physical paper records mm -hmm. for federal retirement. Why haven't we shifted to electronic? I don't know. Well, there's a company that's involved with storing physical paper records that oh. is lobbying Congress to keep that. Um, Congress produces 5,000 reports a year or calls for 5,000 reports a year, many of which are never read. So we've got, we've uh -huh. got, we're using the paper up, we're having people produce these things, and they're producing nothing of value. The people themselves are very valuable, but they're not doing a job that's valuable. So we need to shift some of that to, to jobs that that are dead end, that aren't producing anything that anybody wants to the things that people want. And yet, as, as we become more automated and less, less physically intensive, mm -hmm. it requires less and less labor. Like I just read the other day, McDonald's um, is employing 7,000 robots in Europe. Okay. And that's 7,000 low-wage jobs that are gone. And, and you know that's coming. But somebody else has to build the robots. Somebody has to fix but the not, robots. It shouldn't take 7,000 people to do it, though. Perhaps. That's the yeah. thing. So, but, so it, things always change. Um, you know, when, when uh, the weaving loom back, became prominent back in the 1800s, there was a group called the Luddites. Yes. They went around smashing sure. these looms because yeah. they thought they'd take jobs. But the economy kept growing. There's always disruption, um, whether it's creative disruption or people go without work. 
it, it's hard to address every single individual's economic status with the government. The best the government can really do is look at the big picture, mm -hmm. try to lay out a plan where consumers are at the forefront, where we have working markets, mm -hmm. where the government is providing its best service and goods at its best price and most efficient way. It sounds so simple when you say that. Well, it, I think they've made things complicated for us. Yeah. Let's look at the tax code. Oh, let's know. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, no, I know, yeah. yeah you, look at a, you look at a 1040 form, every single line in there has some sense of favoritism and gives somebody something. Yes. Rather than just them mailing us a bill every year and say, here's what you owe. Doesn't matter your circumstance, doesn't yeah. matter what activity, what economic activity, what family uh, you have. Everybody has the same, is treated the same through the tax code. And I think there's a lot of things like that, um, uh, economic things, industries that are protected. Um, the Jones Act, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, Jones Act says that you have to have an American flagship and an American crew to move between American ports. So what are the consequences? I saw somebody said that the price of gas is 30 cents higher than it should be because of the Jones Act. Wow. When the, uh, when the, storm, the, the winter storms hit the northeast this, this winter, um, they couldn't get road salt to the northeast because of the Jones Act. They, the ships weren't available to ship salt to the northeast. Oh, yeah. So there, there's a lot of things like that. Um, I think when we talk about Congress being effective, doing things, we say, well, how many laws have they passed? Okay, well, how many laws have they gotten rid of? How many antiquated laws, out-of-date oh, laws, irrelevant laws, laws that actually hurt consumers sure. have they gotten rid of? Yeah, and I, I think that's, that's really the focus where I'm gonna, I'd like to take it is that um, look, get the government out of individual businesses, get the government out of the way, make it efficient so that there is more money to do the things that we really need done because right now they're not getting done. Well, I think that's an interesting uh, concept that you would be, you would focus on reducing the number of, because the reason the reason I say that is because I've always thought it's kind of strange that we elect people, we we'll, we elect congressmen, we elect senators, we elect all these people just to make new laws. Mm -hmm. How many could we possibly need, but really? At some point. It the government should be working well, that you don't need more laws. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. So there was a, um, a terrific article called The Dog and the Frisbee. Um, it was written by a guy at uh, the Bank of England, of all uh -huh. places, and had been circulating in the financial community. And the whole idea is that when you watch your dog catch a Frisbee, it looks really easy. But if you're descri describe it through engineering and physics and all that, it's really difficult to explain. Uh-huh. So the best way to, to provide government, to provide regulation and all those other, and, and laws in general, is to make it as simple as possible and just let the, the economy, the markets, and people determine for themselves what's best. Well, I think that's a great attitude. I can vote for that. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for coming today. Thank you thanks, for sir. joining me. And I really appreciate it. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. And thank you. Um, we'll be back again next week, and we'll see you right here at Knights of the Round Table.